to the OpenSIM webinar. My name is James Dunn. I'm a, a research assistant for OpenSIM uh, and also the NCSR. I'll be serving as the moderator for the webinar today. I'm pleased to welcome today's presenter, Glenn Lishwart, who is joining us from uh, Queensland University. Uh, he'll be presenting a talk on simulating the effect of contracture and weakness on walking capacity in cerebral palsy. Here we go to the next slide. OpenSIM is a freely available software application for visualizing musculoskeletal structures and simulating movements of humans and animals. The application includes tools for general purpose inverse dynamics, optimization to estimate muscle and joint forces, methods to create simulations from motion capture, tools to analyze and visualize the results of simulation. The first goal of this webinar series is to showcase cutting edge research that is being performed with OpenSIM. OpenSIM is also growing in geographically diverse community of users. That's the second goal of the webinar series is to provide an easy platform for the OpenSIM community to communicate and to collaborate. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I have a few reminders that before the, uh, about the webinar format. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentations using the Q&R panel. If you need additional technical help, you can also consult the guide on our website. Next slide. Now I'd like to introduce our, one of our speakers today. Glenn Lichwork is a senior lecturer in exercise and sports science in the School of Human Movement Studies at the University of Queensland. His primary area of expertise is biomechanics and muscle physiology. Glenn was awarded his PhD in 2005 from University College London in the UK, where he studied the influence of muscle and tendon elasticity on power output and energetics of muscle. He was subsequently worked as a, as a postdoctoral fellow at the Royal Veterinary College and Imperial College, both in the UK, before turning to Australia on a National Health and Medical Research Council postdoctoral fellowship at Griffith University. He joined the UQ in 2010 and became a faculty member in 2012. He has published 50 peer-reviewed articles, um, acquired more than 2.5 million in research funding, including government funding from the Australian Research Council, National Health and Medical Research Council, Cerebral Palsy International Research Foundation, and Cerebral Palsy Alliance. Glenn has incorporated musculoskeletal modeling in different aspects of his research for understanding muscle mechanics and energetics, particularly related to human locomotion. In 2011, he was one of the first people to participate in an NCRR visiting uh, scholar program here at Stanford. So take it away, Glenn. Well, thank you very much, James. Uh, can you hear me over there okay? Yes, you sound great. Fantastic. Well, thanks again um, for the opportunity to present this work. Um, I hope that there's some people out there who are going to be able to take something out of this webinar, whether it be um, from the basic science perspective and understanding weakness and contracture or from the modelling side of things. Um, I'd firstly like to acknowledge the support that I've had in doing this work. Um, firstly, a big warm thank you to the team um, that are involved in the OpenSIM project, including the NTSRR. Um, I've been really lucky to be able to work with many people from this team, um, starting from some of the advanced workshops that they run um, through to the Visiting Scholars Program. And it's um, been critical support for me um, and it's helped in the development of the work that I'm going to present today. Um, also, I'd also like um, to thank uh, the people who've helped in this work um, that I'm presenting today, particularly um, Dr. Lee Barber, who um, is at, uh, also at the University of Queensland at the Cerebral Palsy and Rehabilitation Research Centre, uh, and also uh, Ros Boyd, who also helped support this work. So I'll start with a brief overview of the presentation. Um, I'm going to start with a basic introduction to what cerebral palsy is, and a particularly focus on some of the secondary impairments of the condition, that is weakness and contracture. I'm going to discuss um, some of the potential mechanisms for these impairments as a background um, so that uh, when we get to the simulation section, it'll help us to understand how simulation itself can help us um, understand dysfunction in cerebral palsy, particularly as it relates to walking. I'm then going to outline uh, some of the methods that we've used uh, to tackle this problem, so this will be a little bit more technical, and provide some insight from the simulation approaches that we've used um, for understanding the impact of weakness and contracture uh, on walking capacity. And then finally, 
I'm going to finish up by discussing the implications of the research and where it might head in the future. So for those of you out there who aren't very familiar with cerebral palsy, um, it's commonly referred to as CP, and I'll probably call it CP through much of the presentation. But the condition itself is caused by a neural or brain lesion, and that typically occurs prior to birth or sometimes during or after birth. And the lesion um, is classified as static, and that means that it doesn't get progressively worse over time. But depending on the location of this lesion, this can have a profound influence on the capacity to move because the lesion influences um, the capacity to correctly neurally control uh, or produce correct neural control patterns in some parts of the body. So because this lesion occurs so early on in development, the altered neural control pattern seems to have some secondary effects on both muscle and skeletal development. This includes having white, weak muscles, tight muscles, and also some bone deformities. So both the primary and neural impairments, um, well, the primary neural impairments and the secondary musculoskeletal deformities all contribute to this thing called motor dysfunction or impairment that commonly presents as a pattern of walking that is deemed abnormal. So two common classifications of this abnormal gait are toe walking, uh, which is more common in younger children, and crouch walking, which is more common in, in uh, older children and adolescents, um, particularly those who suffer from diplegia where both legs are affected. And computer simulation of gait has become really uh, an exciting tool in uh, the area of cerebral palsy because it can help us firstly understand what the muscles are doing during gait that we haven't been able to understand before. And this is uh, some great work from um, firstly Jen Hicks and later Kat Steele and others from particularly the Stanford team where they've examined muscle function and particularly um, things like mechanical advantage and crouch gait. But simulation in cerebral palsy also has a great potential to answer many other big questions like what factors we should be changing to improve patient outcomes. So we can do things like virtual surgery on a model or test the influence of changing parameters in a model like muscle strengthening or direct electrical stimulation of muscles without having to do it experimentally. In our lab, we've primarily focused on understanding the secondary effects that cerebral palsy has on muscle development and how this might impact on gait. So the main noticeable changes in cerebral palsy muscles are a tightening or stiffening of the muscles, and this is typically called contracture. This um, is basically measured as a reduced range of motion at uh, the affected joints. The other noticeable change is weakness, which is due to a reduced um, voluntary force applied by the muscles. And so to understand what causes muscle contracture and weakness, we need to consider the mechanical properties of the muscle and the connective tissue. So in cerebral palsy, contractures can, ha can occur in multiple different muscles in both the upper and the lower limb, depending on the location of the brain lesion. However, today I'm going to be focusing on the more commonly affected muscles in the lower limb, which are also important for walking, and that is the calf muscles. And this is made up of the gastrocnemius and soleus. So in the top image here is a conceptual diagram I'm going to use, which is showing uh, the um, muscle in red here and a tendon here, which is, uh, can be thought of as the Achilles tendon. And the black line in the bottom represents the leg, and the triangle at the bottom represents the foot. And uh, so we have a muscle attached to the skeleton. So when the muscle is relaxed and the ankle is forcibly rotated from a plantar flex position to a dorsiflex position, at some point, the muscle begins to generate passive tension to resist this motion. And the further we push, the more tension it passively produces. And this is due to, uh, or this is due to lengthening of the muscle. So as we go from a plantar flex position to a dorsiflex position, our muscle gets uh, progressively longer. And as it does this, it, it, act, it, it uh, engages the passive elastic properties of the muscle, which produces passive force as a function of muscle length. And this is shown uh, by the relationship between muscle length and, uh, and force uh, down the bottom left-hand graph. In addition, if we were to voluntarily activate uh, or electrically stimulate at each of these positions, we would find that the muscle generates tension in response to the muscle length as well. And it uh, does this in this uh, inverted U shape, like this. 
So it's clear that if we were either actively or passively generating tension in a muscle, that um, this, was, this is going to result in some torque output at a joint because the muscle crosses a joint and the amount of torque which is produced is going to be a function of the force produced in the muscle, which is due to the left hand graph, and uh, some um, relationship with the moment arm, which is going to generate torque. And so we end up having a relationship also between joint angle down the bottom axis of the right graph and torque on the y-axis of the graph. So changes in either the force length properties of the muscle or the relationship between the ankle angle and muscle length are going to have the capacity to change joint angle uh, and torque relationships and effectively um, seem like a joint is stiffer or weaker at a specific, specific angle. So let's consider what happens if we have a muscle which is shortened that is, the fibres are shorter, because this is commonly believed to be the reason for a reduced range of motion. So if the fibres are shortened, then the length at which they generate tension is going to be at a shorter length. Okay, so that's shown by the new black lines in the left graph. And as such, um, we're going to have a greater amount of passive tension produced at any given uh, uh, muscle length, and this is also going to correspond to having a greater amount of tension at any given joint angle. So the shift, um, this is also going to re result in a shift in what's known as the muscle slack length, that is the length at which uh, muscle uh, tension is ge first generated, and also this is going to be related to a change in the joint, joint slack length, that is the angle at which tension is first generated. Now let's consider changing something else about the muscle. Let's consider if we, instead of changing uh, or shortening the muscle, let's now shorten the tendon. And in this case, because the muscle itself is, uh, is unchanged, the force length relationship of the muscle is also unchanged. So the graph on the left is unchanged from our initial situation. However, because the tendon is shorter, the relationship between muscle length and the joint angle is going to change. And this will essentially shift the slack angle and increase the apparent stiffness of the joint at any of the um, joint angles. Another potential adaptation that could lead to contracture is changing the stiffness of the muscle. And this could occur in multiple locations within the muscle. It could occur within the muscle fibers themselves or within the connective tissue or extracellular matrix. So stiffening the muscle will change only the passive length tension relationship of the muscle but this will also, of course, change the passive uh, joint angle versus torque relationship, essentially meaning that we're going to have greater tension at any given joint angle. However, it will not necessarily change the slack angle or the slack length of the muscle. Uh, this will only occur if we have also have concurrent changes in the connective tissue stiffness. Now, finally, let's consider uh, if we have a muscle instead of, which is the same length as, as originally, but now has a reduced volume. So in this case, the length over which the forces would be produced would remain the same, but the active and passive forces would be essentially scaled down. In theory, this would reduce the passive tension produced uh, at any given muscle length. So we'll have a reduction in the, uh, the passive tension, and will, this will also reduce the passive tension um, that we would measure in the muscle. A reduction in the muscle volume such as this would also result in changes in um, the active force production. So we would essentially have a reduced amount of force being able to be produced at any given muscle length and therefore at any given joint angle. So this is uh, the theory um, uh, behind what potential adaptations uh, could lead to the symptoms of muscle contracture and weakness. So we first investigated which of these adaptations actually occurs using an experimental approach. So in a series of experiments conducted by Lee Barber, conducted at uh, Griffith University along with Rod Barrett, we used various ultrasound imaging techniques to investigate muscle architecture or muscle morphology, things like muscle volume and muscle length, as well as mechanical tests um, where we used an isokinetic dynamometer uh, to better understand the whole, mu whole muscle level adaptations that occur as a result of cerebral palsy. So we examined uh, nine adolescents with uh, relatively mild cerebral palsy and compared this to a group of typically developed adolescents. 
So during these tests uh, that we performed in the isokinetic dynamometer, we used ultrasound imaging to track the length changes of muscle fascicles. And the fascicles are essentially bundles of muscle fibres. So in the uh, video which is playing on the left, we have an ultrasound video of the gastrocnemius muscle as it is being passively lengthened and shortened. And the red line here sh shows the uh, approximate length based on the tracking algorithm that we've developed in our lab. On the right hand side video we have uh, uh, an ultrasound video as well but this time it's during an isometric contraction. So the ankle stays at a fixed position and the uh, person is uh, told to contract their muscle uh, and as they do this they produce some for uh, torque which is produced in the bottom and we see that the muscle shortens and also changes its angle and this is because although the muscle tendon unit length is being constant the uh, fibers are able to shorten against the elastic tendon which they attach to. So using this technique we've been able to quantify the macro level mechanical properties of muscle fascicles. Here in this graph on the left hand side we show uh, on the top graph the relationship between ankle angle and ankle torque and this basically shows that uh, that tension is generated in a much more plantar flex position in the group of individuals that we tested with mild cerebral palsy. This is, uh, uh, also means that they, this group of people have a limited range of motion. In the bottom graph, it's apparent that there is, uh, while there is some difference in the average slack length, that is the length at which tension starts to be generated in these muscle fascicles, uh, there is um, the, the, this difference is actually quite small and was uh, statistically insignificant in our tests. It was only three to four millimeters. But there is a substantial difference in how much stretch occurs in the fascicles in response to passive tension, because the slopes of these lines, the slope of our uh, typically developed uh, individual, which is in the dark line, is much steeper than our typically developed individuals in the dotted line. Then we can say that the, fa the fascicles have an apparent uh, increase in stiffness compared to their typically developing counterparts. We also performed uh, voluntary contractions of the muscles uh, in each of these uh, different joint angle positions. And when we uh, perform these voluntary contractions, it's clear that there's a uh, large reduction in the uh, passive tension, which is, oh, sorry, the active tension, which is ge generated by the muscles. So the top graph again, we have typically developed in the dotted line and cerebral palsy group in the uh, solid line. You see that across the range of motion, there's a clear reduction in the amount of torque which is being able to be generated by our CP patients. However, when we uh, normalize this, uh, this torque to the physiological cross-sectional area that we measure from the muscle, we find that the primary determinant of the, muscle fas of the maximum force uh, seems to be um, the reduction in the, muscle, uh, in the muscle size, because these two lines now uh, seemingly overlap through the range of motion which is being tested. So there are certainly substantial changes that occur in the muscles of people with cerebral palsy. But really it's difficult to fully understand what impact these mechanical changes um, of contracture and weakness might actually have on the ability to walk. So the goals of um, the research I'm going to present from here forth were really firstly to, uh, to develop a model which does accurately represent mechanics that we observe in our experimental individuals. So we want to um, represent this increase in stiffness of the muscle fascicles and uh, also um, the uh, apparent weakness that we, uh, that we find. So really to do this we need to be able to develop subject specific musculoskeletal models of our individuals. Secondly we wanted to determine how these individual, uh, how these adaptations of weakness and contracture might influence muscle function during walking. So particularly we wanted to determine whether the uh, activation patterns that are required to produce either normal or typically developing gait uh, are influenced by making subject specific models. Essentially by doing this what this allows us to do is to put stiff and weak cerebral palsy muscles into a simulation of normal gait. And from this we can determine whether a simulation is able to generate uh, appropriate activation patterns to achieve this gait. We can also determine whether these, uh, using these subject specific muscle parameters changes the activation patterns required to generate uh, normal or CP-like gait. 
So to start with, we conducted um, some similar experiments to those which I've already explained, where we conducted uh, a, a series of uh, tests, testing the uh, ankle mechanics and muscle mechanics using an isokinetic dynamometer and ultrasound uh, for measuring muscle fascicle length changes. But we also conducted some, um, some traditional motion capture experiments. And we did these on an instrumented treadmill, which is shown in a picture uh, down the bottom right. And uh, during these, uh, these tests, we were also able to collect uh, ultrasound video of uh, the muscle fascicles during walking. So we had some objective measure of how the muscle fascicles actually change length during walking. So in the first instance, we need to um, be able to generate subject-specific models which represent this, uh, this altered uh, muscle property. To do this, um, uh, we can essentially change the parameters of the muscle, uh, muscle models within OpenSim. So within a model in OpenSim, each muscle has, uh, has properties. So we have a whole lot of muscles which are attached to our, uh, to our body, and these are shown by the lines in this picture. And uh, these are represented within the model uh, as a specific name with uh, very specific properties, which can be shown in the uh, bottom uh, of the screen. So this is a, a screenshot from the graphical user interface. Uh, so if we load an, a model, we can see something like this. And within this, we're able to change uh, specific properties. Uh, so down the bottom here, you can see that we have uh, properties such as the maximum isometric force, the optimal fiber length, and the tendon slack length. And we can actually manually change these and see what influence this has on our, uh, on our simulations. So while we could do this manually, um, this would be a, a tiresome process to be able to uh, adjust these properties so that we get a similar result to our experimental findings. Uh, so instead of doing this, uh, we use a, a procedure which I'm going to outline now. So to simulate the subject-specific muscle mechanics, uh, firstly, we need to use as much experimentally determined data that we have. So we have a whole lot of ultrasound data. So we can do things like estimate uh, the uh, muscle force from the muscle uh, based on the muscle volume and the fascicle length, uh, and therefore the physiological cross-section area. We already know things like the muscle fiber length, and we can assume that the tendon stiffness is fairly similar based on some of our, pre uh, our experimental work. However, there are other parameters within the model, some other conceptual things which are difficult to measure because they're really conceptual, uh, conceptual type arrangements within the model. So these are things like uh, uh, fibre slack length, um, fibre stiffness and tendon slack length. And some of these are difficult because we have multiple muscles around the joint and others because um, there is no actual real uh, measure which can be made. So to determine these things, what we do is we uh, basically run a simulation which is very similar to our experiment where we take the model and we move it from a position of plantar flexion into dorsiflexion as we would do in the isokinetic dynamometer and we can uh, measure the passive force produced by these muscles during the simulation. And if we do this uh, on multiple occasions and each time change some of the properties of our model, so particularly the fibre slack length, the fibre stiffness and the tendon slack length, we can, uh, we can uh, change these until we get a very close match to our experimental findings. And once we have this, then we know that our, um, our uh, muscle model is now tuned for that individual uh, subject. So to do this, um, we instead of uh, manually changing the parameters within OpenSim, uh, the OpenSim GUI, we basically use an interface, uh, the API interface, and uh, within MATLAB, we perform an optimization routine uh, to uh, perform these simulations and look at the output and uh, adjust the parameters until we have a very close match. So because the focus of this research is to be able to perform subject-specific modelling, I'm going to show individual data from a participant with cerebral palsy and an age-matched uh, uh, age -matched participant um, that would be considered a typically developed individual. So in the gra subsequent graphs, uh, the typically developed individual is going to be shown in blue and the cerebral palsy individual in red. And in the top graph on the slide, you can see that the CP individual generates torque at angles in a much more plantar flexed uh, range, and hence the effective range of motion is significantly reduced. However, in the bottom figure, 
It's also apparent that in this cerebral palsy individual, we actually have longer fascicles that generate tension at a longer length than compared to our typically developed individual. And here we also, for a comparison, have, uh, have the output from the generic OpenSIM 2392 model. Um, this is a standard model which is used in OpenSIM, so you can uh, freely access this model. It's been modified slightly so that it uh, uses a different type of muscle model. It uses the Millard muscle model, but uses identical muscle parameters. And uh, you can see that, uh, that there's um, a difference between the OpenSIM model, which is shown in the black line, and the cerebral palsy and the typically developing for the ankle moment versus fiber length. However, if we compare this to the joint angle versus uh, torque relationship, you see the OpenSIM model does a pretty good uh, job of predicting the relationship between ankle angle and ankle moment. So the reason the, uh, the ankle, uh, the fiber length, uh, for the fiber length discrepancies is basically because there is a large vari variation between muscle fiber length between different individuals. And, um, this relates to uh, not knowing uh, exactly what the slack length of each individual would be for their tendons. So the optimization approach that we use is minimizes the difference between the torque output across the ankle range, which is shown in the top um, by the red, red and blue line, which is the experimental data and a fit, and also the torque versus fiber length uh, relationship, which is shown down the bottom. And this video that I'm playing now uh, basically shows the optimization iterations for a typically developed individual uh, where we selectively adjust each of our individual mu muscles, and that's shown by uh, the lines, the cyan, the red, the green, and the purple lines. Those are the individual contributions of the gastrocnemius, soleus, uh, and tibialis anterior muscles. And we can change the, the parameters of the muscle model until we get a very close fit to our experimental data. So compared to the typically developed individual, the main difference in the muscle parameters in the cerebral palsy simulation that drive the difference in the range of motion are reductions in the tendon slack length. So here we show uh, our, uh, our experimental data, which is shown in blue for our typically developed individual, and the optimized model uh, output for joint, uh, joint moment or joint torque at the top versus ankle angle down the bottom. So you see we have a close fit. But also, we also have a close fit between the relationship between our gastrocnemius muscle fiber length and our, uh, and our ankle moment for a typically developed individual. And this is contributed by uh, different muscles, the soleus, the medial gastrocnemius, the lateral gastrocnemius, and the tibialis anterior. So note that the soleus contributes the most uh, to the uh, ankle moment, which is generated in this position, which this is in a knee extended position. Uh, however, the gastrocnemius uh, muscles also contribute uh, to the slack length. We can compare this to our cerebral palsy individual. So now you can see that again, we have a, a much more plantar flexed range of motion. And to do this, as I mentioned earlier, the main change in our muscle parameters that we need to make is just to reduce that tendon slack length. And this essentially just shifts the relationship between our, uh, our, uh, our muscle fiber parameters and our joint, joint uh, output parameters. Our simulations also suggested that to achieve, uh, achieve uh, cerebral palsy-like muscles, um, there were, in all of the simulations that we occurred in, in the four different individuals that we've tested so far, um, we also require a slight reduction in the fiber slack length across these individuals. And this is essentially the relationship between um, the optimum fiber length of the muscle and, the, uh, and its uh, passive slack length. Note uh, as well that the stiffness of the fibers uh, that we uh, was actually fairly consistent across all optimization. So there was no real difference in the fiber stiffness required between our cerebral palsy and our typically developed individuals. Also note that the cerebral palsy muscles in these simulations were um, about 30 to 40% weaker depending on the individual because of differences in the muscle volumes. Okay, so that's how we uh, firstly generate uh, subject-specific muscle uh, parameters to represent cerebral palsy-like muscle. So what happens when we use the subject-specific optimized muscle models in simulations of gait? So to examine uh, this influence, I'm primarily going to concentrate on two muscles affected by the changes. 
So the first is the plantar flexing gastrocnemius, which, is, which has been optimised to be uh, uh, optimised for each individual person, whether that be typically developed or cerebral palsy. And also the dorsiflexing tibialis anterior, which of course works in opposition to the medial gastrocnemius. So in the uh, subsequent slides, uh, I'm going to be talking, uh, the medial gastrocnemius is going to be, uh, data is going to be shown on the top, and the tibialis anterior is going to be shown by the bottom graph. So first I'm going to start by examining the estimated muscle stimulation that's required to produce the movement of the typically developing individual. So the typically developing individual is going to be shown in this graph on the left. And the stimulation pattern that, uh, that we, uh, that's generated was calculated using the computed muscle control algorithm within, Opti within OpenSIM. Um, however, I don't believe that the actual algorithm that's used to generate these uh, muscle activations and basically for those people who, uh, who are beginners in modelling, the idea of these uh, simulations, inverse approach to these simulations, is to uh, calculate the muscle activations that are required to be able to generate the motion that we see and the forces that we see. And so the computed muscle control algorithm is within OpenSIM. Um, you could also use other algorithms or static optimization. And I don't believe that the results that you'll find are going to be greatly different regardless of uh, what you use. So let's first look at the stimulation pattern which we uh, observe from our simulations in the gastrocnemius and the tibialis anterior when we use uh, the generic model from OpenSIM. So as you can see um, in this graph, um, the generic model is shown in the green. Uh, the gastrocnemius increases its stimulation and hence its activation through the mid stance and then switches off in late stance. And this is typically similar to what we see uh, with using electromyography. Meanwhile, the tibialis anterior is primarily activated in the swing phase and also during the initial foot contact. So if we now compare this uh, to firstly the subject specific optimised model for our typically developed individual person. So this is uh, the blue line represents um, the optimised muscle parameters for this individual person. And we see that there's not much difference between the predicted stimulation pattern um, required compared to the generic condition. And that's because there was only a very small uh, modification required uh, in the uh, in the muscle model to be able to achieve this. So now I'm going to uh, look at what happens if we actually put a weak and stiff muscle into our typically developed uh, uh, simulation. So the aim of this type of approach is to see whether somebody can actually generate the required activation patterns to walk in a normal way if they have these tight and weak muscles. And what you can see from, this simula from this, uh, the results of this simulation, that while there is an increase in the requirement to stimulate the medial gastrocnemius during stance, so we have an increase in the required stimulation for our medial gastrocnemius, this is still well within the limits of the muscle. Noting, of course, that this muscle is also 30 to 40% weaker and it's still able to generate the required activations to walk normally. In contrast, however, the requirement for increased tibialis anterior activation with cerebral palsy is much greater and it actually reaches its, uh, its maximum uh, required stimulation. And in fact, to complete this simulation, uh, the tibialis anterior and the other muscles acting around the angle joint are not able to generate the required tension to be able to produce this simulation without a little bit of additional help from what's called reserve actuators, which are essentially uh, just uh, actuators in the model which are allowed, enabled uh, to uh, generate torque when the muscles are un unable to generate uh, the required torques to produce the movement. So this indicates that uh, contracture may not necessarily be uh, the limiting factor during a stance phase. However, it does provide a, a, a rather large uh, impediment to being able to put the foot into the right position during swing phase. So if we have a stiff muscle, this does impede uh, the foot placement during swing phase. Of course, a key feature of uh, toe walking in, uh, in cerebral palsy is that the foot uh, often, or the forefoot often hits the ground first rather than the heel. So it lands in a much more plantar flex position. So it's likely that this is a direct result of contracture rather than necessarily the, uh, a reduction in the, um, in the capacity for neural control. 
This is, however, a bit of a chicken and egg argument as to which causes what. Um, finally, um, we can also compare our simulation outputs to EMG data that we collected during these same trials. And so the EMG data is shown in the black dotted line in this graph. And you can see that uh, we get a relatively good temporal alignment between our, uh, our gastrocnemius uh, muscle activation parameters and also um, we also have a reasonably good match during for our tibialis anterior. However, there's uh, some uh, slightly slight differences in the actual uh, amplitude of these muscle activations. So now if we look at an individual with cerebral palsy and compare the three different models. So here we have a, a simulation of somebody walking with cerebral palsy and therefore they've got an altered gait pattern. And we can again put in the three different muscle models. So we have the generic muscle model, a muscle model which has been optimised for the typically developed individual and a muscle model which has been optimised for the cerebral palsy individual. And you can see here that there is a discrepancy between the simulation outputs for, the, uh, for what the medial gastrocnemius is required to do, so that's shown in the red line, compared to the activation during mid-stance uh, when we use a typically developed or generic muscle model. Particularly, what this shows is that uh, the uh, Optimised cerebral palsy muscle is much better able to uh, predict the uh, stimulation patterns that we see experimentally, which are shown in the dotted black line. Of course, the forces um, still need to be generated by some muscles, and in this case, the calf muscles selectively use uh, the calf muscle that's selectively used to generate torque during the uh, early stance phase of, uh, in gait uh, in cerebral palsy is the calf muscle, and the reason it's selectively uh, Reduce, uh, selectively used is because um, the medial gastrocnemius is penalised from being used because we also have slight knee flexion during this stage and hence um, the muscle is at a, quite a short length. So the results of these simulations clearly show that uh, some element of modelling muscle contracture is required to accurately determine the neural control strategies in cerebral palsy. And this is ultimately going to impact on our uh, on our uh, predictions of what forces the muscles are going to be producing during these, stimula during these simulations. We can also look at the forces that are actually generated by um, the gastrocnemius muscle. I'm going to focus on the gastrocnemius muscle in this slide. Uh, and the force produced is uh, shown on the y-axis and we again have the typically developed individual on the left and the cerebral palsy individual on the right. And remember again that the cerebral palsy uh, muscle in this, in this simulation is about 30, 33% weaker um, than in the typically developing muscle model. Um, so uh, although um, what we see here is that the gastrocnemius actually still produces roughly the same amount of force. Of course, the activation required to produce this force is actually higher in, uh, in the cerebral palsy muscle. So we sh showed that in the last slide. However, the requirement to activate the muscle is actually reduced slightly when we actually consider the uh, role of passive forces during this simulation. So the graphs, these graphs show in the solid line the, uh, the forces produced in each of our generic, typically developed and uh, cerebral palsy uh, simulations. And the dashed lines show the contribution of passive forces to these simulations. So, um, you can see that in the red line, uh, the red dotted line here shows that the, in the, when we insert a cerebral palsy-like muscle into a typically developed uh, gait simulation, that a, a much larger percentage of the force is actually generated passively during these simulations. And this actually has, uh, has the effect of actually reducing the amount of activation which is required of the muscle. Note as well that when we uh, use, the, uh, use the stiff and weak muscles in the cerebral palsy simulation, however, that these passive forces actually disappear. So there is no passive force being generated. Even when we use a stiff and weak muscle, which is shown in the red curve, uh, there is no requirement for passive force generation. Um, the bottom graph that I'm showing now also shows um, what we call the reserve actuation, which I alluded to earlier. And this is really for the people who are interested in, in, in modelling. And uh, uh, basically when we do these simulations, if the muscles aren't able to generate the tension, then we have this increase in the reserve actuation. And what can be clearly shown here is that as 
uh, we go into swing phase when the tibialis anterior is maxing out its activation, there's a clear requirement to generate tension uh, in, our, uh, in our cerebral palsy-like muscle to be able to overcome the uh, stiffness of the muscle at the other side. And at the same time, we also have a large increase in the passive forces which are being generated by our medial gastrocnemius muscles. So moving close to the end now, um, and as previously mentioned, um, the length changes of the muscle tendon unit are actually largely um, dominated by the stretch of the tendinous tissues which are acting in series with the muscle. And our ultrasound measures that we use during our gait clearly show that the typically in the typically developing population, which is shown in blue, and the dark blue traces here, that the muscle fascicles uh, actually act at act relatively isometrically during most of the stance phase with a short period of shortening only at the early stance phase and during the, uh, during the push off phase. And, but during the same period where the mass muscle fascicles are isometric, the muscle tendon unit is actually stretching. And this is achieved because we have elastic tendons which actually undertake most of the stretch of the muscle tendon unit. If we compare this to our cerebral palsy group, we see that while we also have an increase in the length of our muscle tendon unit during the stance phase, uh, we now have a period where we actually have a very slight lengthening of our, uh, of our muscle fascicles during the stance phase. So essentially the muscle fascicles don't, uh, experimentally don't seem to be acting as isometrically. We can compare this to the outputs of our simulations where we, have, where we can access the fibre length changes of the muscle fibres. Of course the muscles also the muscle models that we use also represent this nice elastic uh, Achilles tendon. And what we can see, and this gives us good confidence that our simulations are doing something correctly, are uh, that the simulations can correctly produ uh, predict the isometric phase in our typically developing individuals, but also correctly predict the slight increase in length that we see in the, me in the medial gastrocnemius fibres during the stance phase in our cerebral palsy group. Note that the amount of stretch that occurs in the muscle fibres in the uh, simulations in the cerebral palsy group is not sufficient to generate an appreciable uh, passive tension. Um, however, in real life, this stretching may also result in some element of uh, stretch reflex responses or spasticity. So that brings me to the conclusion of this work, um, and it can be fairly easily summarised as follows. Firstly, um, Muscle contracture can be effectively uh, simulated uh, and to do this in these muscle models, the primary thing that needs to occur is just essentially a reduction in the tendon slack length and maybe a slight reduction in the fibre slack length. But uh, the tendon slack length certainly has um, the biggest uh, effect. Um, weakness and contracture um, we showed has really little, uh, li limited effect in preventing normal control of movement during the stance phase. However, weakness and contracture does limit control of the ankle during, the normal, uh, during normal movement in the swing phase. So we saw that to generate, uh, to generate normal movement with a stiff muscle, we'd either have to have really strong tibialis anterior muscles or have some assistive device to be able to uh, achieve a, a normal heel strike pattern. Also, um, if we use these generic muscle models in our tracking simulations of cl clinical populations such as cerebral palsy, we may be using, uh, getting incorrect estimations of muscle activations and therefore muscle forces and, and hence um, using subject specific models or actually modelling contraction and weakness uh, within these simulations seems really important if we're going to try and understand what the muscles are doing. Of course, this is really just preliminary work and there's plenty more work to do in the future. Um, here we've used an inverse approach to calculate the required neural control um, for specific movement patterns. But really it's clear that subject specific models, um, uh, that using subject specific models is important, but in the future it'll be really important to be able to not just do this inverse approach, but also use the forward simula simulation approach, which is where we apply uh, an activation and see what uh, what uh, what movement occurs, but when we do this we can also make uh, specific changes to the model. So we can move the muscles, say virtual surgery, functional electrical stimulation, or we can increase the strength, um, uh, which would essentially simulate strength training. And we can see whether when we do this, this actually has a knock-on effect on um, the actual movement which occurs. 
To achieve um, these uh, these types of simulations, however, I think there's still a great deal of work that needs to be done in improving the current modelling techniques. Uh, my own focus is uh, particularly trying to improve the um, the way in which the muscle models are actually implemented. So there are essentially the muscle models at the moment are one-dimensional elements, and uh, they don't really have a good uh, a, a good representation of the actual muscle morphology. So we have a series of elasticity, which, which is actually represented by both tendon and aponeurosis, and these things um, are, are, are not necessarily um, simple to model. Um, we also have things like extramuscular connections between different muscles and also intramuscular connections. And there's a great study by De Bruyne et al., which has recently been published, which, um, which demonstrates the potential for uh, increased stiffness of these intramuscular connections in cerebral palsy. And of course, there's also various three-dimensional, 3D geometrical shape changes which might influence um, the forces which are being produced by the muscles. So with that, I'd like to firstly thank the people um, who've helped to do this work, particularly Lee Barber, um, Ros Board, and also Rod Barrett for the early experiments of work. Again, thank you for the Open Tim team, and thank you uh, for the funding that I've received to be able to do this work. So hopefully there's still some people out there that, who are awake and are ready to ask some questions of this research. Yeah, if we could go to the next slide, Glenn. Thanks, Glenn, for the great talk. Um, let's start the Q&A session. All of the questions will be text-based, so if you go to the Q&A box on the bottom right hand of your screen and type in your questions, uh, please make sure you uh, select uh, Ask All Panelists. Uh, we're getting a few questions coming in through uh, now. Um, I'll ask the first one to you, Glenn. Um, it's about your reference data. Are you uh, drawing information from a single individual for these optimizations, or a handful of individuals, a lot, or a large population? Uh, yeah. So at the moment, at the moment, everything is subject specific. So we take we have a group of uh, typically developed individuals and a group of cerebral palsy individuals. So today I just showed one individual, and it, of course, um, the changes which are which are required depend on the severity of the disease in cerebral palsy. Um, so some people obviously have much stiffer muscles than others. Um, uh, at the moment, we're doing it uh, on a totally subject-specific basis. So we do the simulations of every individual. Um, we'll use their own muscles, and then we'll use a representative, typically developed muscle um, uh, in, in those simulations. Um, and that's the way we want to continue it um, uh, in the future. Um, we can then, of course, pool the data from all of those simulations um, rather than pooling the experimental data into the simulation. Great. Um, Eric from Sweden uh, says, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, his question is, uh, I guess you cannot measure all muscles that are in the model in your experiments. Uh, so how do you treat the muscles in terms of adjusting uh, these to the specific subject in your question? So they're probably the muscles that you haven't, haven't collected in data. Yep, thanks for the question, Eric. Um, it's a great question and certainly uh, very relevant for this. At the moment, um, we, of course, are concentrating at looking at the muscles around the ankle. Of course, um, we can have weakness and contracture in the hamstrings and in the quads and also around the gluteal muscles. So there are lots of muscles which could be weaker. At the moment, we're just treating these as being able to um, or having uh, normal function. Uh, and this will, of course, also influence our muscle force predictions. It is possible, however, um, obviously, to be able to generalise um, uh, mu uh, muscle weakness throughout the model. So we could, for instance, change all muscles to be 30% uh, weaker um, and see what that effect what effect that has. And that's similar to the approach that uh, Kat Steele used in, in one of her simulation studies. Uh, however, we don't really know enough about um, contracture at the hamstrings at the moment to be able to understand um, uh, necessarily what um, pr properties there are to use. And it's really difficult for us to experimentally test these muscles um, with ultrasound, for instance, because the muscle fibres are really long. Um, it is, however, something that uh, we're uh, working on developing and being able to determine uh, whether the same types of mechanisms are responsible in the hamstring compared to the uh, calf muscles. And uh, yeah, hopefully one day we'll be able to uh, insert that into our simulations. Thanks. Uh, Apova um, says, great talk. Uh, her question is, how do you choose how much to reduce the tendon slack length versus the optimal fiber length of the modeling contracture? Uh, that's a great question, and I, I kind of didn't get a, a great 
um, great uh, chance to explain it e easily during this uh, presentation, but I'll try and explain it uh, as best I can now. Essentially, because we know um, uh, how much, or we know when the muscle is required to generate torque based on our uh, simulation, uh, sorry, based on our experimental work, we have the relationship between torque versus angle. We also have the relationship between fibre length and angle. We just basically uh, progressively change those uh, properties, um, particularly tendon slack length, until we get a good match between our experiment and our simulation. And, uh, and this is uh, obviously dependent on the individual person, so that's why it's really important to have this subject-specific approach. Um, but it turns out that all of the simulations that we've done in our cerebral palsy group, um, who all had relatively mild um, uh, contracture, but certainly um, a, a range of motion 15 to 20 degrees less of our, of our typically developing population, in all of these, the main parameter which needs to be changed is tendon slack length. Thank you very much for that one. Uh, Duran, like, uh, also says thanks for the great talk. Um, the question is, how did you experimentally define optimal fiber length? Was that done during a maximal isometric force production at a certain angle? Um, yeah, uh, that's a good question as well. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, that's exactly how we did it. We have isometric contractions during uh, during these um, during these uh, experiments that we do. Um, it's basically uh, in nearly all cases the maximum tension which can be generated is generated at um, maximum angle of dorsiflexion. So there is a possibility that we might, because of the reduced ankle range of motion in our cerebral palsy group. Um, that we might actually underestimate the optimal fibre length slightly, but that is the value that we use just as a consistent measure is that um, the, 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 sorry, the length at which um, our muscle fibres are during an isometric contraction where they're maximally activated uh, and producing maximum force. Thank you. Uh, we don't seem to have enough, any more questions coming in. I'll ask one more uh, uh, from myself uh, to see if anyone else has got another one coming in last minute. Um, Glenn, it seems like the tendon slack length um, is really important in these models and, and having good ways of uh, uh, optimizing for those is, um, seems to be really important for subject specific modeling. Do you, do you see any way in the future of being able to get those experimentally from subjects um, using any new techniques on the horizon? Um, well, it's difficult because the tendon slack length at the moment is, as I, as I mentioned, is a, it's a bit of a conceptualised um, uh, element within our muscle models. It's not necessarily a real length. So we can measure the length of the Achilles tendon from uh, origin, from the muscle tendon junction to the uh, to the insertion on the bone, and that's quite easy. But that's not actually the tendon slack length, um, which is. Uh, which is conceptualised in the model um, because this includes, the, in the model it's basically the muscle tendon unit length minus the fibre length uh, which, um, which gives us our tendon length um, and this in real life would be um, a combination of the tendon plus all of the aponeurotic tissue um, which transmits the force from the, from the muscle fibres. And so I think um, to be able to incorporate some experimental measures from morphology um, like for instance, from uh, ultrasound, the 3D ultrasound technique we use, or even MRI, we really need to have a better um, muscle model um, which can actually model um, the tension or the um, model that each of those individual elements, both the tendon and the aponeurosis. And to do that, we need to have some more knowledge about how the aponeurosis actually structures as a force, um, as a force transmitting structure. There are there's some good research which shows that it's not necessarily a simple linear spring-like structure that it's influenced by things like muscle bulging and transverse strain. Um, and so until then, I think it'll be very difficult to experimentally determine it. Um, but that's why we came up with these types of techniques that we could actually um, use as much experimental data as we can to try and tune the model so that we can get these tendon slack lengths as, as close as possible as we can um, using the combination of ultrasound and dynamometry. Awesome. Thank you very much. Looks like the uh, questions are finished. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Great. Uh, OpenSim, oh, yeah, that one. OpenSim and its webinar series are supported by several grants from the NIH and the EU, including an NIH grant that funds our National Centre for Simulation and Rehabilitation Research. 
We are also supported by the DARPA Warrior Web effort. Uh, next slide. Uh, thank you for the great discussion, everyone. The, the questions were really good. Um, Glenn answered them very well as well. Uh, information about our center and upcoming events and other resources for the OpenSIM community are available at our website. And the address is on the screen. Uh, go to the next one. Um, if you please complete the survey that will appear in the pop-up window at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, this will help us improve the webinars and choose upcoming topics in the future. Uh, thank you all for participating, and we hope that you continue to stay involved with the OpenSIM project. Thanks.